Man, good morning, you guys. Man, it's good to see you. I gotta wait all week to see you. Once a week, man. I love you guys. Thank you, Pastor Josh. Thank you, band. That was awesome. Um, yeah. Hey, my name's John Maroos. I'm the lead pastor here, and uh, I just, man, I, I wish I can't wait to slow down and just spend time with you guys. We gotta get this wall out of here and uh, drop a service and just slow down and be together. I want to tell you guys, thank you. I want to tell you, great job, even if you're struggling. Um, some of you have been grinding, and some of you guys have been grinding financially, and you showed up to our FPU uh, ministry that we have, and you have had radical breakthrough. I'm getting, the, I'm getting the emails. And then some of you guys showed up at the auto marriage. And thank you guys so much who put all these, all these uh, ministries on, and we have heard of amazing stories that have come from the art of marriage. Um, this, this church blows me away. It, it, it never fails that I'm somewhere and I run into someone who's been touched by Frontline. Sometimes I try to get away from you guys for an afternoon. No, I'm playing. Uh, but I, I was, uh, yesterday I was in the woods really early. I know it sounds we- weird, but I was praying. I was walking with the Lord. It's a sweet thing. And I was praying for you guys because I love you. And I was praying for a spirit of generosity as we're going into this series that you would litter the KMC with acts of generosity changing people's lives. That's my vision. That's why I left California. Well, that wasn't hard, but that's why I came here. Um, but uh, I want to tell you the far-reaching impact of this church. I'm, I'm praying, and I'm, I'm pretty deep in the woods, and it's pretty early, and there's a fog rolling through the woods, and it's beautiful. The leaves are uh, changing, and I'm just walking with God. And there's no one out there because that's a really dumb place to be that early when it's freezing. Uh, but I, I like to do that. And I was walking down this trail, and there's this lone lady, like, coming at me. And she's, maybe she's here. And uh, <laughs> it's unbelievable, you guys. What are we? I, no, no, I was dumb. You were exercising. And, uh, and I'm not even kidding, like. I'm praying, she's in the zone, I'm in the zone, and we both kind of like did this, and then she turns around and she goes, hey, you're my pastor, <laughs> and I'm just like, man, I'm sorry I'm in the zone, and she's like, I'm in the zone, and it was just like, look at the far-reaching impact, the woods, Ikea, I don't care, Trier, last time I was there, hey, Frontliners, you know, it's like, this is a real miraculous movement that we call Frontline, and I'm so thankful for this place. Now, I'm in those woods because my last spot got taken over by Frontline Prayer Warriors, so maybe it'll happen in, in those woods too. I don't know, but praise God. It's good to see you. Uh, yeah, real quick, I got to get into the sermon because I really want to get to communion. We have a drawing here just to give you phase one of what we're doing. As you can see, December 7th is our important date. These are all important dates, but that's, that's when this wall comes down, and then the 8th, which is Sunday... You can see how quick this is moving. Our kids, our older kids from the back room are up here. Now, I want to tell you this. I'm doing this for you. Our pastors are doing this for you. We love your children. And we want your children to have a space where they can learn about Christ and be wrecked in a great way for the glory of God. Um, We are hiring right now as well. We're stacking our kids' ministry team And we're doing all this because we believe in your kids and we believe in Jesus Christ. The 14-year-old changed my life. Uh, She knocked on my door when I almost threw the towel in with this chick I was partying with. Um, And uh, she invited us to a church, what I would call a kid. It's because I'm getting old. A 14-year-old. I just wonder what God's going to do with your children. And so I'm excited to do this for you because we care about you and we, we believe in Jesus Christ and what he's doing. So again, uh, sign up, help us to knock this down, especially if you have anger management issues. <clears throat> Just come on in. We got dangerous weapons for you. Um, no, I'm kidding. But we're going to take this down. We're going to move the kids up. This is going to set us up for Christmas Eve. We'll have an overflow for Christmas Eve. And then sometime before Easter, we're going to have a full expanded auditorium here, and we're going to drop uh, down to three services instead of four, and it's going to allow us to slow down. Yeah, we're going to slow down just long enough, and then we're going to launch a campus. How's that? I didn't come here to travel. Let's do this. All right. 
Go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles up here. We'll put all these verses behind me. Put a finger in 1 Timothy 6 and, and then go to Luke 3. If I already lost you, don't worry about it. Luke 3 and 1 Timothy 6. I am super pumped. I'm drinking chamomile to come down. It's not working. Part two to an awesome series to lead us into this project called Giving Away His Game. But I got another motive behind this series. I'm not a big money guy. I was an atheist for 20 years. I thought I was an atheist for 20 years. I don't know if I believe in it anymore, that anybody, because of the revelation of God, can, can honestly believe there is no God. And if you're an atheist, I know your jam. I know your rhythm. But it was giving that I used as an excuse on why I never went to church. I never went to church because I didn't want to look at my heart. But I want to show you what the Bible says about giving, and I'm not interested in taking five offerings and milking you dry. It's one of the most generous churches I've ever seen in my life, and we're really bad at asking for money because we trust the Holy Spirit and we trust you. So what I want to do is I want to, yeah, I want to talk about the building. Next week, primarily, we're going to show you two ways that you can par partner with us to help us with this building. But beyond that, I want you to be generous with your lives. The Bible says, and we'll talk about it next week in 2 Corinthians, that this really radical group of Jesus followers were first generous with their own hearts. And so more than money or anything else, I want to flood the KMC with people who are generous with the currency of love and the currency of hope and the currency of the gospel. And I want to hear stories all over these villages, more than we do now, because we hear it all the time, of what this great body of believers, this movement is doing in Germany. So we're talking about giving away his gain, and I want you to write this down and take a picture of this. Here's the subject of part two, feeling alive through generosity. Feeling alive through generosity. Write that down. My atheistic journey was one of finding life. I searched everywhere, you guys. Um, I was a poor kid, grew up on welfare, da-da-da. Uh, my mom's a superhero. I love that lady. She raised a bunch of have-not crooked kids as we were running the streets, drinking, fist-fighting. But it was all about finding life. I couldn't find life anywhere. And so I tried to find it by being feared, being a tough kid, uh, playing pro ball. Um, God broke seven bones, seven bones later. When he says no, he says no. It was an act of mercy because I would have ruined my life. Um, I tried to find life in other places, Buddhism and, and uh, metaphysics and education and all these things. And I came up empty over and over until I was, I was faced with Christ over and over again. But this was my journey, and I want you to... I want you to write this question down. I want you to ponder this. Here's what's going on in the human soul. Here's what we're asking ourselves every day, even if we don't know it. If I only had, and you fill in that blank, I would feel alive. What is it for you? I still battle this. I still battle this. And we're just human beings. We're doing our best, but we're humans, right? We've got these aches in our souls, even if we're Jesus followers. We still have these aches in our souls, and we're still trying to fill in that blank. And the cool thing about being a Jesus follower is that blank got a little bit shorter, didn't it? You're like, I got Christ and I'm feeling life. I'm feeling this new life outside of everything. But there's still this void that we all battle and we all chase to try to fill it up. And the hard thing about being, being a human is we're yearning for more. We're always yearning for more. We're looking for a deeper way to live. And because we're just these physical creatures, we often look to things, to stuff, to material things to feel alive, don't we? Um, why do we really buy new cars? Well, one, because it's Germany and you can drive really fast. That's number one. I mean, come on, if you don't got an Audi by now to go fast on the Autobahn. Um, no, I'm kidding, but um, why, do we, why do we buy new cars? Why do we buy new clothes? There's nothing wrong with this, but just to search out our souls, isn't it mostly because we want to feel better? I mean, just to be honest, I know it's, it, that is it with me. And again, if God blesses you, we're not in a vow of poverty. There's nothing wrong with having a, a, a nice home or a nice car or something like that. But when we, when we try to fill that gap right there behind me, it's so dangerous. And let me show you the example that I'm tracing in culture. 
where we, we feel empty inside. And, and boy, young people should get this. This will save you a lot of pain. We feel empty inside, and we're material creatures, and so we naturally gravitate to material things to try to fill the void. In 2000, some of you guys weren't alive. Anybody remember 2000? Yeah, all right, thank you. I feel better. I remember where I was on New Year's Eve. Wasn't the world supposed to end? We all like woke up and we're like, dang, what was that? <laughs> well, in 2000, the year 2000, guess the number of books published on fulfillment. Throw me a number. Don't throw it, but 50, 50. Eight years later, in 2008, 4,000 books were written on fulfillment. What does this tell you about the, the human psyche? Now, with that, where are we trying to find fulfillment? Today, the average household credit card date that we know is $9,000. Now, some of you are like, dude, I've doubled that. It's all good. <laughs> FPU is coming. Don't sweat it. But it tells you, I'm, what I'm trying to do is open our eyes. Like we have this longing uh, based on all these books that are coming out on fulfillment and, and trying, to, trying to feel alive, and yet the credit card debt and possessions keep rising and rising. We're, we're trying to do one with the other. And the crazy thing that my little atheistic heart uh, came colliding into was this, you guys. If I'm not just physical, I'm soul. I'm more than body. I'm more than sex and cars and clothes. I'm soul, then I can't take physical things and try to do something to my soul with physical things. My soul is empty, my soul is thirsty, and my soul is hungry. And for the first time, this radical movement called Christianity, which I had the wrong picture about. I walk into this church and they tell me, dude, Jesus won't satisfy your soul. He'll overwhelm you. And you're like, what? Yeah, Jesus doesn't say he wants to fill your cup, the cup of your soul. He says he'll make it run over. He doesn't say he'll, he'll get a nice little, you know, precious little stream running in your soul. He says he's going he's gonna to crack through a river. And for the first time, I started realizing that Jesus alone can radically overwhelm and satisfy my soul. But we're in a compare culture, and it's hard, guys, because we're always being told to get this and get this and get this. And I'm not against the Internet, I don't think. I feel like I need to be loyal. I'm from Seattle, and I spent the last years in, in, in the Bay Area. Um, but the Internet is so good at letting us know what we do not have. Parents, please, guard your children's hearts. They're being bombarded. By 10 years old, 1 million ads telling them what they do not have and what they need. Blows my mind. And, you know, social media, which we're not against, we're here in, in Europe, and it's great to stay connected, but we know way too much about what other people have, don't we? And we're always comparing and saying, like, dude, oh, they're in France this weekend? I, I'm in church, they're in France this weekend? You know, I think people are going, they're on front line this weekend? That's no fair, that's what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, we got social media, and, and we all know this game. We all know that social media is not, not entirely real. We all know it's, it's a version of our lives, and that's okay. Um, but I've been saying this for a while. I wish some of you moms at like 2 in the morning with a little bit of vomit on you and your hair's like, pfft, I wish you just put a selfie on and be like, real life, hashtag. <laughs> We're getting a view of what is partial, and we all are, it's FOMO, it's fear of missing out. We're going, maybe I can feel my soul with these things. Um, I've been quoting Jim Carrey. I don't know why this guy's been like in my head lately, which is not a good thing. But uh, you know the funny man, Jim Carrey. How many of you guys know, remember Jim Carrey? Remember he was the guy? He was a nobody from a broken home in Canada and became the guy, married a Playboy model, and, and he, was, uh, he was grossing the most money per movie. And then he had all these breakdowns. And if you, if you listen to his latest documentary, the guy has either found his mind or lost it. And he says this, everybody should get rich and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it is not the answer. And that's the problem is you sell out your whole life for these things and these, these possessions and this wealth because you're hungry in your soul. And I'm not condemning you. We all do this. But once you get them, what Jim Carrey is saying is they lied to you. 
But you, you gave away everything. You gave away family and experiences to get this stuff. And now that you're staring at the stuff, you're going, my soul is still empty. And that's why so many people get bitter at their vocations after they find out it didn't work. So it's a hard balance. Um, in Luke 3, I love the power of the gospel, what Christ can do to the hearts. He just radically frees us over time with this. In Luke chapter 3, there's this guy, his name's John, and, and uh, he's the baptizer, and he looks like a homeless guy from San Francisco. No joke. He's got, he's got this crazy hair and wild eyes, and he's wearing like really crazy clothes. But everybody's coming to him. All the wealthy people are coming to him. But they got all the wealth. They should be happy. John should be coming to them and getting a new get up, right? He's wearing some nasty clothes. But there's something in his soul. There's something in his eyes that say, I found life. And so all these wealthy people are coming out to this ragtag, have-not dude who's got life in his soul, his eyes. And the crowds asked them, what then shall we do? What happened is they just came to Christ. They just said, look, if Christ can give life, we give our lives to him. What do we do now? What's the first step? We're ready. Isn't that awesome? Remember when you first got saved? Remember that hunger? Don't ever leave that. What do we do now? What, how would you answer that question? Someone comes to Christ this morning, and they come to you like, what now? Craziest thing. John goes like this. He answered them, whoever has two, two winter parkas from the mall, share one with someone who doesn't have one. Make a separation from wealth. Everyone talking about the church wants your money. John's saying, give your stuff away. Whoever has food is to likewise. If you see poor people and you got enough, man, then, then go, go do something and change someone's life. Jesus, Jesus has you. Verse 12, tax collectors. The stinking IRS showed up. They came to be baptized. They said, we want Jesus. Like we thought power would help us. We want Jesus. We accept Jesus as our Savior. Teacher, what should we do now? What's the first step? He goes like this. Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Quit ripping people off. Money's not your answer. You got God now. Money, money, money. Verse 13. He said to them, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Verse 14. Oh, we got a military community that comes out. Now they come to Christ and they're totally confused. What branch do you think that is? I'm going to leave that with you. I'm playing. <laughs> Got to be careful this weekend. <laughs> Verse 14, the soldiers, guys, also asked them, okay, we just came to Christ. What shall we do? Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusations. Don't use your power and your authority to rob from people. Just be content with your paycheck. You've got a greater thing in God now. Every single movement was make a clean break with trying to use money as power, value, and identity. You have Jesus now. Isn't that crazy? I wrote this down to myself this week. Living for yourself is a type of slavery, John. Living to serve others is a kind of liberation that, that's revolutionary. I want that. I'm in a radical place right now. I'm exploring this with all my soul. What does it look like to tap into more of life in my soul by being radically generous and helping people around me? So I'm going to give you one thought. This is, my, this is actually my family's journey right now. My wife and I are sitting around talking about this. Uh, we went shopping and talked about this. No, we didn't. <laughs> but I want to give you one point today. Generosity frees us, guys, from the hold of our possessions, and it makes us feel alive. And I am so experiencing this right now. So I'm going to go to 1 Timothy 6 and just show you. I'm going to spend about 15 minutes is all. And I'm going to unpack this uh, real quick. Some principles to help us to be generous. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Generosity frees us from the hold of our possessions and makes us feel, feel alive. What is a 1 Timothy anyway? Well, Timothy's this young kid. He's a millennial. He's a Gen, Gen Y. He may be a Gen Z. And this old man writes him a letter. His name is Paul. Now, old people don't know what we go through. So certainly this letter is going to be like, it's like getting an email from your grandpops. Like, come on, are you serious? And he's schooling you on money. He's schooling you on school. You know, you're kind of like, ah, oh, this guy, I love him, but I love him for like Christmas Eve stuff. <laughs> Not money. 
But there's something about this old man leaned over a desk in this old house with a Roman soldier chained to his arm. You see, he's a prisoner. This Paul, this old man, his back is scar tissue. He looks like a homeless man as well. He's given away his life, not just his stuff, his life. He earlier in the letter says, bring my books. It's all I got left. And so he writes to this young kid, this millennial, and he says, I need to teach you a little thing or two about how to use your wealth if you want to feel life. And this young kid is a pastor, is a young leader. We have a lot of young leaders in our church. And he says, I need you to teach this to God's people, that they find life through Jesus and by being generous, not by stockpiling stuff. And so we pick it up in verse 17. You can imagine this young guy. Ah, I got another letter from the old man. But there's always something bothering him in his mind about the old man, Paul. See, like John before in Luke 3, Paul's got something about his spirit. He's got a freedom. He's got a life to him. And uh, this young millennial, he's savvy, and, and he's in Ephesus. It's this hip city, and he's got technology, and he's reading, uh, he's reading the old man's letter while he's on Instagram, and he's trying to build a church through all this stuff, and, and yet he knows this old man. Every time he's around him, this man is so free in his soul. So he says in verse 17, as for the rich, and he's ending the letter this way, which is really interesting, as if to say, don't forget to teach this in your church, young man. As for the rich in this present age, now just stop right there. Who are the rich? The rich are those who have more than the basic necessities. That's us. I'm not trying to be rude if you're struggling or you're financially not in the place you want to be. But anybody who has more than the basic necessities of daily food, according to Scripture, is rich in that day and time. So I could say, hey, frontline visitors, those who call this our church, as for us in this present age, because this present age has a different message for us, charge them. Paul's like all fired up. The old man's getting cranky here. He goes, young man, get fired up and tell them with urgency, do not be haughty. And that's like the first warning he lays out about wealth and about money. He says, don't be haughty, don't be cocky. And see, there's a problem when we get wealth. And, and wealth is not wrong. It's if we allow it to do something to our souls, that's when it's wrong. Dude, live in the biggest house that God will give you. It's all good. But it's when we invite someone over and we're like, you know, in the, sl in the, in the silk slippers, and we're like, come in. <laughs> like anybody does that. But see, wealth is a, is a dangerous thing. It, it can do something to your soul. And he says, please tell them to be careful about what wealth and prosperity and promotions can do to your soul. Wealth is a power, guys. It is a power. Here's why it's a power. Because it interacts with our deepest pains. See, some of us are insecure. I should say all of us are insecure at some level. And what accumulation of wealth does is it makes us say, I'm better than you. Not all of us, but it can. It can take an insecurity and it can say, look at how much better you are. Why? Because you're a better human being morally inside. Nah, because of the shoes, because of the car. It can take a pain and it can actually take that pain like insecurity and make it worse. It can take something like value. I struggle with value. Like, does this world uh, value me, and I'm, I'm an underachiever, and, you know, my spouse works, and I don't, and I got a degree, and I'm not using it. It can take a, a pain of value, and we can, we can take money, and we go like this, I'm better than you, as a way of, like, coping over that, that value pain. Things like identity, who am I? You get money, and the world says you're someone, but you can still be so dead inside. And that's why Paul says, young man, please don't let these precious people Take wealth and mask the pain they have in their hearts with it. We use wealth for something else. And isn't it crazy, you guys? Um, think about the last time like you got a new car or a new, um, I don't know, house or outfit or like a toy, like a truck or guns or I don't know. I don't know what your toys are. <laughs> think about the last... How come they don't last? How come the shine doesn't last? You ever notice that? You, you know, you get that new car and it's got leather seats. And it's like, dang, we finally got leather. <laughs> and, uh, and you're like, we ain't going to McDonald's no more, kids. Because <laughs> them french fries never, never disintegrate and you're not stuffing them on my leather. And then like three weeks later, you, the car's just a stinking, it's like a station wagon now. 
Like you're tucking fries in because you don't want to vacuum, you know? <laughs> or you get those new kicks and it's like that first week, like you get home and you get the, the cloth out and you're like, Shh. but then after two weeks, you're just like, ah, oh, man, these ain't nothing. Why is it that new things li- lose, lose, lose their excitement? Here's why. I write this down. We don't use them for their intentions. And here's what God does. He goes like this. I've given you those things. And if you use them for their intentions, I'll continually release joy. But if you start using them to exalt yourself or be selfish, I'll suck the joy away. And I want you to be miserable so you'll use it again for me and I'll release the joy again. Did you get all that? Get the recording. Let me show you what I mean. Parents, here's a a quick little seminar. By the way, I'm trying to find a venue for a a radical marriage and and parenting conference next year. I'm just telling you that. But we are trained that if it's placed in our hands, whatever it is, it's for me. God places it it in our hands for us to use it a specific way. That's when we'll feel joy continually towards it. Now, kids get phones young these days. My kids are grown up. I always say, if my kids were still little, I'd do this and that. I probably wouldn't, but I say it, it makes me feel better about myself. I would never let my kid have a phone. That's what I tell myself. Um, But I'm not raising kids. But think about when you give your kid like a phone, and they get their first iPhone. You give them an iPhone. You say, okay, it's your birthday, I'm going to give you an iPhone. Here's what you do. You go like this. This is not your phone. It's your birthday. That's your birthday, but this is not your phone. This is my phone. I'm giving you this phone on Lent. So when you Google something or you text your boy, you remember, you use that phone like I'm standing right next to you because that's my phone. You remember that. (laughs) Mine. (laughs) What are we telling our kids? We're saying that's not yours. If you use it my way, you'll find joy. If you use it your way, I'll snatch that thing out of your hands. This is what God is saying. God gives us ways to use stuff, and when we use that stuff that way, he releases an awesome joy in our souls. And I'm going to give you two ways that Paul unpacks here uh, in 1 Thess- uh, Timothy chapter 6. He says, the first is this, we have to use our things, our possessions, unto God. 1 Timothy 6, 17, the last part, he goes, God richly provides us with everything to enjoy unto him. My family about 10 years ago stumbled on this, and we started doing this crazy thing, like we are eating pancakes to the glory of God. I'm not kidding, like we started doing this crazy weird thing, like we're going on this vacation unto the glory of God. You see, and it started changing everything because I didn't come back from vacations all exhausted from consuming. I came back from vacation saying, well, I saw the God of the universe creation, and I connected the vacation to God. And he released the joy in me because that's why he gave me that creation. And now I'm like driving a car into the glory of God. I'm saying like, God, you gave me this car and you gave me this little house and you gave me this backyard and you gave me those deer, man. They're awesome. And every time I connect it back to God, God says, that's right. You're not using it to exalt yourself and say, do you got deer in your backyard? (laughs) You're doing it and saying, God, you're amazing. And he's going, yeah, feel the joy. And, and that's why the cars and, and the house and, and all the stuff that I have, that's why, that's why it's not wearing off. The newness, the awesomeness is not wearing off because I'm feeling God through it again. And number two, he says, use them for others and I'll release joy. Use your stuff that I've given you to manage for others and I'll release joy. Verse 18, they are to do good. Those who have plenty are to do good with the stuff that God has given us to be rich in good works. The wallet is fat in the soul. We're to give away and to, to do good to those who need it. And God says, when you use your stuff that way, man, I'll blow you away. It'll feel awesome in your soul. Be generous and ready to share. That tells me God is trying to speak to us. Be ready to share. Look at that wording. Get ready when you're at the gas station. When you're, at the, when you're at the store, when you're at home and you got kids, when you got that coworker, God's trying to speak to you. He's trying to tell you, like, I've given you stuff. I've given you a car. I've given you the gift of love. I've given you spiritual gifts. I've given you the gospel. It's on your tongue. Give away, give away, give away, and I'll bless your soul. I was over at Aldi across the street. I got to hurry. Knock that wall down. I was at Aldi, and... Uh, and there were these two ladies in front of me. They may be here also. 
<laughs> I gotta, I'm going to so mess this up. And uh, I'm in line, and they, they go like this. Oh, yeah, that church, you can see our church from the window of Aldi. When you're checking out, they go like this. Oh, yeah, I've been checking that church out. And I'm standing behind them. Like, it was, it was like, th- this could be awkward. <laughs> I mean, I got my gummy bears, and I'm like, what if they start busting on us? Like, what if they're like, yeah, I visited with that pastor, man. You know, am I going to, like, mess, am I just going to cause a scene right here? And I'm, like, really, I'm, like, all insecure, and I'm, like, dang, they're talking about our church right now. And they're, like, yeah, I visited last Sunday and all this stuff, and and then uh, behind me, this German lady is in one of those, sh- those motorized carts. This, she's this precious little old German lady. She's behind me, and I know she's talking to me. You know, you know how that is? You're like, okay, I, I don't speak Deutsch. I'm working on it, but um, I know you're getting mad at me, and uh, I'm trying to hear what they're saying about me. <laughs> and she just gets louder and louder. And when people speak Deutsch... When they get sharp, it sounds like sharp, you know? You're like, dang, man. And, uh, and she's like, you know, then she starts like ramming me, and I'm like, no, she didn't. <laughs> but um, she's like really getting my attention, so I swing around, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, do you want to fight? No, I didn't. <laughs> I, I turn around, and I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. What's going on? I'm, you know, and I'm, I got one ear towards the ladies because I want to know what they're going to say about me. And uh, I'm not thinking about being generous at all. I'm thinking about, like, fighting. And... Uh, and she goes, oh, you speak English? And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, uh, you must be a young GI. I know. I'm like, this is so cool. And I'm like, nope, I'm not, but um, yeah, let me help you. <laughs> and I'm listening. I'm like, ah, let me just get this done. I got to hear what they're going to say about me. And I'm throwing all this stuff on the conveyor belt thingy. And, uh, and she goes like this. And you know, in Aldi around here, there's no background music like Taylor Swift ain't pumping in the, the grocery stores. And so um, everybody's looking now because this lady caused a scene, not me. And I'm put, I put all her groceries up there and the two ladies are now looking and they're like this, oh, how sweet. And she goes like this, oh, you're not in the military. What do you do? <laughs> Remember, these ladies are, are about to say something about my church. And now, she, and now everybody's looking. She's like, and she's getting louder. It's like I paid her. She's like, so what do you do? And I go, be ready. Be ready to do good. I get choked up because <laughs> this lady just put a church service on. And the whole stinking grocery store is staring at me. And I go, see that little warehouse out there? I passed through that church. Of course, she looks me up and down. She's like, are you sure? <laughs> it was an unbelievable moment. This whole store was just like staring in. Guys, God is trying to get us to look around us and move into doing good to people with our stuff and our love. There's a lady who I'm all over this situation who just tried to get here as a part of our team and had a really, really bad morning. And we are so going to rally around this lady. We are going to be rich in good works. We're going to be ready to share. And so maybe you're here and you're like, I don't get it. Why should helping people be remotely appealing to me? Because you long for a deeper calling, guys. You long for a new way to be a part of the healing of our world. You do. You're wired that way. And that's what this building is all about. It is about reaching into the lives of your children and getting them to God. And so one day when you're back in New Jersey or Texas or Washington or wherever you're from, You know that you had an investment in this building, but it's beyond that. It's about us going to Christmas markets and stores and saying, God, who are you trying to get me to be generous towards? And what is my currency you want me to spend? Is it love? Is it the gospel? Is it a hug? Is it a flat tire? Is it money? I I don't care. I I just want to feel alive by doing it your way. And to feel alive through generosity, guys, we just need a couple things. I would encourage you. We need normal rhythms of generosity. That's why the church is an awesome place um, financially, but also volunteering, 
You know, we had a parking lot team who started our parking lot team. I used to watch them dance in that parking lot as they park cars. We need to give away. We need to have rhythms, weekly rhythms, where we're constantly letting go. But we need the thrill of spontaneous generosity where our our eyes are opening and we're watching for God to call on us to do something powerful in someone's life. Guys, don't be afraid of living without because you're being generous. Don't be afraid of living without. Be afraid that you've never lived. I read this. I ran into Josh's office, one of our pastors, and I'm like, dude, check this saying out. We'll run out of time before we ever run out of stuff. That's what Paul says in verse 19. Young man, teach them to store up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And we're going to move into communion now. And the band's going to come up. Can we remember all that Christ gave so our hearts are stirred? Let's bow our heads. Let's take a posture of worship. And let's prepare our hearts. Let me just give you a few instructions. And then I want to let us worship. In just a minute, please don't do it now, but in just a minute, we're going to play two songs. Anytime in these two songs, you can take that bread and you can take that juice and you can partake as a family, as friends, by yourself, up here at the altar, stand, sit, just be touched by God. And as you hold that bread, friends, and you hear the lyrics of these songs, see him there hanging on the cross. He was broken for us so we could be broken for others. When you hold that juice in your hand, feel it. He poured out his blood for us so we could pour out generosity to others. Let the cross touch your hearts. Let's transform this place.